This is the Weather Lounge here at Weatherworks. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Weather Lounge here at Weatherworks. I'm your host, meteorologist Brad Miller. And if you're tuning in for the first time, thank you for joining us and listening to our podcast. Weatherworks is a private forecasting company located in Hackettstown, New Jersey, but our services stretch across the United States. And as always, joining me here in the Weather Lounge is my very polite and courteous co-host, meteorologist Mike Mahalik. Hey there, Mike. Hey, Brad. What's going on? Did you like that inter- that uh, introduction? I was very pleased with that introduction. <laughs> I, uh, you know, now everybody knows I'm a nice guy, huh? <laughs> 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 but, yeah, well, you know, it's you know, I, I got to come up with some real good ones for the upcoming winter. I think I'm going to have a list, and then you're going to have a list. You know, I'll, ha- I'll have you pre-approve it though, but maybe I'll throw in once in a while and kind of surprise you. Hmm. Let's not make it too surprising. But uh, hey, man, it's already. Uh, geez, July's almost over, Brad. I mean, really, it's crazy. <laughs> It's amazing. I mean, we you know back in March we're like, oh, we can't wait for the warm weather, the hot weather. Now it's like mid summer and we're thinking already about winter outlooks here at weatherworks and yeah our first preview our first winter preview mike don't forget is in mid-august and i'm sure you'll you'll be a part of that with jim sullivan but uh you know it's 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 crazy to believe that you know that's that's that close already (laughs) yeah i mean we start thinking about uh the upcoming winter in mid-august you know we send our clients um kind of our first thoughts um you know looking at the uh, ocean temperatures across the globe, and then we try to get that together for them to at least give them an idea. And then our final outlook comes out in October. Um, but uh, all right, well, well, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Let, let's enjoy the rest of the summer. We still got some time. The kids are still home from school. We got about another month of that. But um, anyway, Mike, I know you're a big beer connoisseur, and you like to try all the different <laughs> local craft breweries. Hey, I do too. But what about but what about wine, Mike? Do you do you like to have a nice glass of Cabernet on the front porch? You know, I do like wine. I, I do like red wines. I like dry wines. Um, usually, I go for like you know you said the Cabernet, or I go for a Merlot uh, or something like that. Um, you know, I, I my wife loves the very sweet wines. She likes the um, uh, what is it called? Um, I know oh. what you're saying, yeah. But very sweet. It's almost like a wine cooler. It's not even wine. Yeah, I, I have a tendency, though, if I have those, they're so sweet that it makes me thirsty, then I have to go drink a beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, for sure. Uh, oh, like the Riesling. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Stuff yeah, like yeah. that, uh, she definitely likes. But my problem with the wine is that if I open a bottle of wine, I never finish it because I'm the only guy drinking the dry wine and my wife hates it. So that's that's my problem with the wine, and then it's like, well, I got to drink wine every day. I mean, then I start. <laughs> it does have some health benefits, though, Mike, especially red wine. At least that's what I tell my that's what I tell myself. You know, <laughs> that's what I hear. But uh, but really, what we're we're bringing up wine because we're going to be talking about weather and wine and how the weather affects the whole uh, wine making process and how it affects the grapes and. We have a meteorologist that will be joining us today. His name is Zach Graff. He's uh, worked with preparing some forecasts for vineyards in California. So he really knows the intricacies of how um, the weather works with, you know, the grapes and the vineyards. So it's going to be interesting. And uh, man, I think this is going to be a great podcast. Uh, It's kind of a weird angle that, that you might not think about but uh i think it's going to be very interesting so yeah it's, it's an integral part of uh, of the wine uh whole industry i'm sure with the with the weather so i'm sure it's uh like you said little subtleties within the you know different temperatures and precipitation i'm sure it all has a you know a big uh big impact on what happens with the uh the vineyards so with that we're going to take a quick break And after we return, we're going to have meteorologist Zach Graff on the program. He'll tell us all about the ins and outs about weather and wine. So don't go away. Have you ever needed weather data for a snow removal contract? How about a slip and fall incident? Searching for the information online may sound simple enough. However, it can be tedious and difficult. Good news. Our data and stats team can simplify the process. We'll find any weather information from daily rainfall and snowfall totals to hourly temperatures and seasonal averages. On the legal side, our forensic department routinely produces certified reports by meteorologists. 
assessing the weather conditions on and around accident dates. So don't waste your valuable time. Give WeatherWorks a call today at 908-850-8600 or email us at data at weatherworksinc.com. Remember, when you think weather, think WeatherWorks. Welcome back to the Weather Lounge. And today we have meteorologist Zach Graff joining us to chat about how the weather impacts growing and producing grapes and eventually making wine. So without further ado, welcome Zach to the Weather Lounge. How are you doing on this fine summer day? I'm doing great. How about yourself, Brad? Oh, we're doing okay. Uh, I just want to uh, you know, bring you in here to the Weather Lounge. And uh, you've worked at vineyards. You've prepared forecasts for vineyards and, and the weather and you know, wine. It's, it kind of goes hand in hand, doesn't it? It really does, especially out there. So give us a little uh, background on, uh, you know, your weather and your meteorological history and, uh, you know, basically, you know, where you went to college and how, how you got into forecasting at vineyards and things like that. So I went to school at SUNY Albany in upstate New York. Um, while I was there, I was interning for the New York State Mesonet, um, which is a collection of 150 weather stations throughout um, New York. Um, I started out as an operator just looking at the data. But I eventually got into all the instrumentation. And what I mean by that, the temperature gauges, the wind monitors, um, the data loggers that collects all that data. And after a while, I got sufficient at that. And I actually put in around 50 of those weather stations in New York. And then when I graduated, um, I actually got a job out in California. I didn't know it was with the vineyards at first. I knew it was with instrumentation and with forecasting. But when I got out there, like, yeah, our biggest clients are vineyards from Napa Valley, Sonoma Valley, um, Pastor Robles, which are the big AVAs out there, or the big. Yeah, if you enjoy wine, you've heard of all those areas and different types of uh, or different regions that they come from in California. Exactly, um, and then I did there, and I came here. I've been working here for three years already. So, and you're going to be going to get your master's, though. I am. I'm going to pursue my master's here shortly, come August. Excellent. Congratulations on that. That's for sure. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Mike. So where are we going with this here? We got some, uh, we got some wine experts here. We got some, uh, I, I just want to hear all about this stuff. This is going to be good. Well, yeah, I think, I think uh, Brad knows a little bit more about wine than I do. I'm more into the, uh, the craft beer side, but um, Zach, let's just, uh, you know, before we get into all how the weather plays, why don't you just explain the difference? Uh, between the different types of wines, between red and white and rosé and dry and sweet and, you know, all that kind of stuff that people might not know about. I got a few friends that have no clue about what they're drinking, so. Absolutely. So if you go take, say, a red wine like a normal Cabernet and you squeeze that grape on that vine, it red juice doesn't come out of it. Actually, clear juice comes out of it. People don't think that. So the difference between red and white rind is actually they put the skin in during the fermentation process. That's what actually makes it red. During white wine, they take it out, and that's why it's clear. And with rosé, they leave it in just for just a tad, and that gives it that blush, beautiful rosé color. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that either. <laughs> yeah, that's, see, we're already learning things today. <laughs> and therefore, that's why the reds have higher alcohol content because of those skins. I knew I liked the red more than the white. <laughs> <laughs> so the skins somehow provide more alcohol content. Yes, during the fermentation process of the wine itself. Interesting. So what makes a wine like dry versus sweet? It all the deals with one weather affects a lot of it um, due to the temperature fluctuations throughout the day. Um, how much moisture, how much rainfall there is. So usually... Like a strong, bold red, you need, you need really hot temperatures. I mean, you need to talk about 105 degrees during the day. But what's great about California is compared to, say, on the East Coast, it drops at night substantially. It can be 105 degrees during the day and drop down to 45 degrees at night. And those temperature fluctuations lead to different acidity levels in the, in the grape itself. And that's why even from vintage or vintage, if you're not note line, vintage is basically the year it's made. The same grape in the same vineyard year to year can taste totally different, even with the same recipe for the wine, because of the different rainfall, different temperature days. You know what I mean? If it's colder one night compared to another, or if there's a string of hot days or a string of cold days. 
So that must be a real challenge for the the winemakers because I'm sure they have their set wines that people are used to getting. And if they, you know, get a certain, whatever they call, you know, the wine, like there's a a vineyard near me that has like a wine called the Godfather. And it's like, they want to taste that same thing when they buy that bottle. Um, So it's, it must be really challenging to get that right. It is. And that's why it's so scientific. Even like UC Davis and all the colleges out there, there's a lot of professors that deal with like base with wine and the science of wine, because it is like chemistry. It's just like baking. It's a lot of chemistry involved with that. A lot of research. So, so where, where is the, like, uh, all right, let, let's say, let's, let's take a vineyard, for example, out in California. Let's say, you know, one year they end up with, you know, normal rainfall. The following year ends up with rain that's, I don't know, 30 to 40% below normal. And the year after that, it's 50 to 60% above normal. I mean, is there a taste difference then between the three or is it, where, where, where is the, what, what's the difference then with the, with the precipitation? With that itself, it deals with the grape, you know what I mean? So if there's more water, the grape will be more for, you know what I mean? You could see the size difference of the grape too. It will absorb more water. I mean, does it taste different though, based on the, t- the amount of? It, it does, but I'm no wine connoisseur. You know, I'm no, no sommelier where I could actually like taste the difference. But there, people can taste the different tannins in the wine, the compounds actually in the wine itself. But people can taste that, and that's why people who can taste those subtle differences do that because some people don't have those palates to taste that. Right. Like what Mike was saying too, it's hard because you try to replicate a recipe year in year out. And sometimes you just can't because the weather doesn't allow you to. Interesting. So you talked a little bit about uh, California and how their temperature fluctuations, you know, um, play into the grape. Now, why is it then the Northeast can't get those bold red wines like a Malbec or a, let let me try this one, San Giovese? I got that right? I'll, I'll give you that. I'll, I'll give it to ah. you. Okay, close I'll enough. I'll give it to you. It's because out here, it's just too much rain. It, it's too cloudy. You know what I mean? Out in California, you'll have weeks without seeing a cloud in the sky. Um, you need that You just need that sun to hit those grapes. Um, out here, it's just, we just have too much precipitation. We see too many weather systems. You know what I mean? Especially last thing about last, what, three weeks here? How many, to- how, how many times has it been cloudy and rain? Almost every day. You know what I mean? They don't have a tropical system to drop seven inches. You know, I mean? that would really ruin the consistency of the grape, out, especially out there. Um, so the sunny skies out there really helps compared to here, where it's super cloudy all the time. Um, and it's rain. It's it's not. It doesn't get as hot. Yes, yeah, been hot here, but it's also the humidity levels out here. It stays very humid. Um, out there, you go outside and use some chapstick pretty quickly. It's super dry, and that's why all the wildfires happen. So then what is like the, the best grape to go with here in the Northeast? Like say if we're in New York. So a big one is Riesling, the one that your wife likes because it's okay. sweet. Um, it's cooler. You know what I mean? And a big one is Concord. That's a big one out in, the Nor- in uh, out New York. It's Concord and Riesling. Those are the top two um, for New York for sure. Concord grape jelly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, I guess somehow that makes a, a, a sweeter grape. Um, with the conditions that we have here, that and also depends on the varietal of itself. When I when if you don't know wine, varietal is the type, which is a Cabernet. Those are just not wine names; they're actually great names. You know what I mean? That's what it's grown off. If you go down a vineyard, you'll see a Grenache or a Zinfandel um, vine. You know what I mean? They're all they're, they're different types of vines. They're not. They're, it's not the recipe that they make. It's actually the grape itself. So that's the name of the grape. That's interesting. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know that. Did you know that, Brad? Mm, no, I not really. I, I know I know the vineyards themselves are you know they each have their. It's almost like a you know, uh, I guess there's subtle differences between this vineyard and the one that's a mile away, but just enough to where I guess it has a different taste. So let me let me ask you this, and Zach, and this may be a good question for a lot of folks out there too. It's not really all that weather related, but so. So what's the difference with me buying a $15 bottle of wine at the wine store or you go out to a nice restaurant? Granted, it's they upcharge everything, but 
why is there a bottle of wine that's like six hundred dollars and it's you know is that is that because of the just it's not made all that often or just the demand for it one's demand but two it could be the the grape vine itself some of those grape vines out you see in napa valley they're a right. hundred years old right they've been producing grapes for hundreds of years um and there's only so much to go around i guess exactly and some are maybe five six years old and those really old vines they produce great grapes and therefore great wine it all depends it all depends on the winemaker too you know what i mean you got the best grapes in the world but if you can't craft a good wine like just you can't craft a good beer you know what i mean no one's going to drink it i guess um, that so, holds true for all around the world you go to france you go to italy and you, you know you find these 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 unbelievable wines and you know you can definitely taste the difference but 100 percent. you can taste the 400 dollars bottle of wine compared to a 20 100 you, without a doubt you can i would agree with that because i could certainly taste the difference between the more expensive wines you know uh, my wife maybe not so much and just like i give her a craft beer or something say hey try this one and she's like, it tastes like beer. I'm like, oh, my. no, it doesn't. Like, you got the hoppy it, flavors different yeah, here. Yeah, there's different things going on with this one. Don't you taste like the the mango, or don't you taste the the grapefruit in this one, or or what it might be? Um, but she's just like, ah, tastes like that. But I I do appreciate when I have a good glass of wine the difference um, between just getting your you know run of the mill uh, you know basic uh, brand that you would see out there. Fun fact, never, ever open a bottle of wine and just pour and drink it right away. Ever. No, you got to let it. You got to let, let it. Let it breathe. Uh, let it breathe. Decant it. Right. Yes. You got to let it breathe. When you when the air goes into the wine, it brings out those flavors. So that's why you ever put a bottle of wine and maybe come back to a half an hour. You're like, oh, why does it taste a little bit better? It's not because maybe help that you're getting tipsy at that point. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. <laughs> but it's really the air getting to the wine. Let those tannins and the compounds of the wine actually come out, come to fruition. Interesting. See, I just figured that out. Well, I already had one glass, so now I'm just oh man, it tastes better and better. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's why you decant it. That's why you uh, use an aerator before you pour your glass of wine, especially for reds. So for a uh, casual wine drinker like myself, so if I just open a bottle, I should just let it sit there for a little while before I actually pour a glass. Exactly. Let it sit there for like tw- 20 minutes or so. I, you know what I saw on TikTok? I saw someone put wine, like a, like a $10, $15 bottle of wine into a blender and then blend it for like 30 seconds and really airify it basically. And they say it unbelievable. I haven't tried it yet, but I may have to. And they said it tastes I've never like, seen they, that. It turns a $10 or $15 bottle of wine to taste like a $100 bottle of wine just because of how much air and frothiness you get in there. Interesting. Oh, I never yeah, I have to heard try of that. that before. <laughs> what if I pour the wine into the glass, but let the glass sit for a little while? Kind of the same thing. Okay. Because think about it, when you put it into the decanter, <laughs> it's still glass. It's just sitting there. It's the pour that does it, right? It's, it's the pour. It's not sitting. It's actually getting it out of the bottle and let it breathe, like Zach said. Yeah, it's kind of. All right. Well, now I got to run out and get a bottle <laughs> of wine and try this out um, <laughs> because now, now I'm uh, uh, excited to try a, a different wine. But um, You'll thank me later. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> um so let's let's bring it back um you know we talked about new york we talked about california is that the two best states to be growing wine in the unit in the united states i would say new york is not the greatest california is 100 percent the region you want to be in to grow wine that is the in even not in just the united states but in the world you know what I mean? People talk about California grapes into the world with the Italy's, the France's of the, you know what I mean? California's up there without a doubt, just because they have so many, they have just so many regions to grow it. Right. I just figured like Italy or, or, or France or something like that would be um, the place you want to be. A lot of times you can take those, those, those French grapes, Italian grapes and grow them in California because they're very similar in climate. In spots, I know South America. Yeah, South America is another spot. Uh, there's some good spots uh, here. And California is so vast because you can go into the Sacramento Valley, where it can get to 115 degrees, grow wine there, or you can get to the coast in Sonoma Valley, where where you are from towards the bay or further north, the marine layer comes into effect and adds added moisture in the nighttime. It cools off the grapes. It gives that little little dew on it, and you know what I mean. It gets hot during the day, but it cools off at night. You get down to San Joaquin Valley, 
again, they get 115 degrees, it gets hot. But they also have mountain, you know what I mean? They have mountains there too. They grow the wines in the mountains. So all the different little microclimates you have in California is suitable for so many different types. Microclimates, yeah, that's the word. So so let's let's go back to where the temperature fluctuation comes in. And you, you were talking about, you know, it can get so hot during the day and so cool at night. So what happens like as you transition from like kind of winter in the spring or summer in the fall and you know, maybe it doesn't get to 115, but you get to like 90 during the day. But at night now, you get that big change. Now, what happens if you get down towards like freezing? It's still pretty nice, but you may have a couple of hours where it's like 30 to 33 or something. I mean, is is there a chance that the grape could freeze? Could it, could it you know, impact, you know, the growth of it or end the growth of it? I mean, what, what, what you, we've talked about kind of these things in office, what, what they do. And I couldn't believe some of the answers you told me. Absolutely. So people don't understand. People don't think just because it's California. I've experienced 20 degrees in California. It drops like a rock out there at nighttime and people don't think that. They only think of the hot. But what they do is when we call frost forecasting because it's such a big thing when it gets close to 32, there's a lot of different ways to help the grape stay at freezing or keep it above. Um, With regards to Keeping above, you can do something like wind turbines. If you've ever been in a vineyard out in California, you'll see turbines placed around the vineyard. They'll actually mix the warmer air above, which we call a temperature inversion, and mix down the warmer air to keep the grapes above freezing. Because if it does freeze, it can kill the grape. It can kill an almond tree. It can kill a lot of crops out there. Um, Another way is you can actually water them and let them actually freeze. You'll freeze the outside, but the inner core will actually stay just above freezing. That's what they don't want to do that, but if that's the worst case, they'll do that. Right. I think some of the orange growers in Florida will do that during a severe cold break or you know outbreak exactly. in, in the winter time. Yeah, they'll they'll insulate them with the ice because I mean, really, ice and snow is a great insulator. But like you said, you're trying to you're trying to keep the the fruit itself alive instead of this outside of it. But the coolest way is with a helicopter, especially you have some big bucks. They bring in helicopters and they do the same thing as a wind turbine, but on a grander fashion and actually come over the grapes itself and bring down the warm air over the grapes throughout vineyards, through over almond, like almond trees and orchards. And that's what they do. Just to keep that air mix. Yeah. When, when you told us that in the office, I was like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Have you ever experienced this, uh, Zach? Oh yeah. I've seen a helicopter come in and mix down the warm air. It's, it's nuts. And also with crop dusting as well, when they put uh, when they try to fertilize it too. I mean, they're probably they're no more on top of your house. They're probably 20, 30 feet off the ground, going 100 miles an hour in a plane. You see them come dive bomb down, go over the vineyard or the whatever they're using. You make know, like the uh, the row crops or whatever it is, and then they just keep going like that down the row. It's wild to see. So, so these helicopters that come out, I mean. Well, they do just hover over the vineyard all night long. It won't be all night long, but, but when they get close to, you know what I mean? They'll ask, they'll ask if I'm a meteorologist in charge that day, what time is it going to get close to freezing? You know what I mean? You're not going to do it if it's 40 degrees on the ground at that point, because you're just wasting, you're wasting a lot of money, but it's more of those peak, those peak radiation nights. Like when three it gets to set. 6 a.m. Something exactly, like that. Exactly. Right before sunrise. Like when, what's the worst case scenario? And they'll come down and actually mix down the air. Wow. So, I mean, obviously the cost for something like that is really high, but uh, I mean, I guess compared to the cost of losing your crop. (laughs) Exactly. What's a couple hundred thousand dollars when your, your, your crop and your thing could be tens of millions of dollars. You know what I mean? It's just an expense at that point. Yeah. I was gonna say that makes sense when you think about it in here in the Northeast with the, and we talk about refreeze and things like that. I mean, you know, what's it get, when's it get colder in the Northeast after a snowstorm and it's clear and calm versus a windy cold night or like a windy night when it's 35 versus a, a clear and, you know, calm night when it can get down to 20, just because again, that, that, that cold dense air is able to sit and not get mixed around. So it makes sense that, you know, you have to even do it, especially in the valleys, I guess, in California. Oh, the, and there's so many different little valleys out there. I've seen temperature be 100 degrees during the day. It got down almost to 32 at night in the same day. Because the dew points out here, everyone know what a dew point or relative humidity. Out here, it could be, you know what I mean, 90 over 72. Out there, it's 100 over 10. I've seen negative dew points out there 
where you go outside and you shrivel up like a grape. You turn to a raisin. <laughs> nah, no pun. No, I, I, I've been out in Vegas uh, once, and it's, yeah, it, I'll tell you, it's like 104, and it's like the dew point's like 10, and the relative humidity is like 8%. But I, I don't care. You know, and then when people say, oh, it's a dry heat, I don't care. It's 108 degrees. It's hot. you got to drink a lot of water. It's actually so dry, it feels cooler. I, I understand. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, it, it's not as bad as like here in the Northeast where it's hot and humid uh, all day, but uh, it, it's still pretty hot. I'd be in 115, 120 degree weather, and guess what? You're not you're not going outside. Nope. You feel sometimes you feel bad where it's sunny like almost for a month straight, and it's so hot that you want to go outside and do things, but you can't because you you'll shrivel up. You know what I mean? So I think we pretty much hit on this earlier, but. Um... We're talking about how the same grape can, from the same vineyard, can taste different from vintage to vintage. Now, it, that's just basically straight from all the weather effects? Could be straight weather effects. Maybe they change one thing in the recipe. We like that. Or our people who taste it, we, we want to add a little bit more of this. But a lot of it is the weather itself. You know what I mean? How much water is in the grape? How much water is not in the grape? You know what I mean? How much sunlight did it get? How much how like I mean, how much it didn't get um was there a wildfire that season was there not a wildfire that season you know what i mean did it get too cold at night did it not get too cold at night there's so many variations um there's powdery mildew which is kind of a uh it's not, not a fungus but kind of is that gets onto the grapes that can that can hinder the taste that can hinder the grape growing so you know now that you mentioned some wildfires i mean we all know that the west or at least if you don't, the West has been very dry um, this year, and I think the couple of years prior too. I mean, big wildfires out there. Um, I mean, that's got to have big effects on these vineyards, right? Oh yeah, it's it's scary for them, especially if it's in and around them. Um, what they'll do to try to prevent it, they know there's a wildfire in the region, especially if it's towards harvest time. They'll harvest it early. It may not the grape might may not be mature enough, but They'll do it just to save it, you know what I mean? Um, so they can make some wine out of it. Um, it they'd rather make some money than no money. Um, but what, what they'll really do is they'll actually irrigate the hell out of the grape. I mean, they'll trench the vineyards with water. As you guys know, fire is just like, it acts just like a liquid. It'll take the path of least resistance. Um, I've been out there where you'll see a wildfire come through. It will eat up all the buildings around it but not the vineyard itself because it's so moist they're like yeah why am i going to go in there and they'll go it'll go around it and sometimes that's how you'll see pictures with houses too where some before wildfire they'll drench their house and all their stuff with the hose and sometimes they will get saved it does happen yeah that is quite interesting and now i mean it's not only the wildfire concern i imagine but the all that smoke that gets produced by the wildfires. Now, does that cause a problem too? For the grapes? Absolutely. Um, there's a chemical in the grapes um, that are, there's a, there's a similar chemical in the ash. And once it touches it, it is not good. It'll get, the ash will actually go into the wine. It's called, it's called smoke taint. And you'll actually taint the wine and taint the grape before it, even the wine's even made. And people will, there's certain really bad years. I think it was, 2019 2018 and people will just if you're a big wine drinker you will not buy wine that year especially in the region that the wildfire was in because they know that it's not going to be the same wow it, it makes that much of a difference oh yeah big time it, it just turns it turns it disgusting can't the marketer just slap uh you know infused <laughs> uh with smoky flavor or something smoke infused <laughs> red wine yeah they wish they could do that, or or, or aged in uh, in bourbon barrels or something. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, does there is there a is there a feet taste to the wine from all the stomping or? Uh, nah, I'm never, only kidding. I, I haven't tasted it yet. If there is, I haven't tasted it yet. <laughs> are there, no, 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 serious question though. Are there vineyards that actually still do that? I mean, I would assume. I mean, I don't know. I don't expect you to know that. Yeah, I'm just wondering. Even maybe some of those artisanal, you know what I mean, kind of places, they probably do it for kind of maybe a tourist attraction. I bet they still do. Um, but a lot of big ones out there. It's 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 scientific. Even some of the mom and pops. I mean, you go into the process. I mean, it is scientific what they do. Interesting. I don't know, man. 
You just don't, you know, you just don't grow grapes, stomp them, throw some sugar, let it ferment, and call it wine. No, it's a lot more in, in depth than that. Now, now, here's a question for you, Zach. And I, 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 we didn't even really go over this. Hopefully, it won't uh, cut, catch you too much by surprise. But I have had before. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of it, and you probably had it too. It's called grappa. It's made from the stems of the grape, right? I've never tasted it, actually. I never had that. I've had, it's, it's. I guess it's a. It's a. It helps you die. It's digestive, I guess. You're supposed to have it, I think, after a meal, but it's made, I guess, from the stems of the grape, and it, it's a. It's a really strong alcohol. It's like a regular type of like you know forty proof alcohol, I guess, that comes from the stems of grapes, and I've had it before. It's kind of a bittery kind of taste but it has a lot of uh, antioxidants that's probably why it's good for you yeah yeah so i was wondering if you ever had you ever had that mike grappa i don't know i have not no but it sounds terrible <laughs> you can buy it at a <laughs> liquor store i'm just saying it i know it's, no, it's from it's made from the stems though of, uh, of all these grapes too have you guys ever had ice wine yes i've had it actually down in disney have you mike i have not had ice wine i wouldn't even know what it is it's sweet i know that it's it's sweeter than drinking like Coke. You know what I mean? It's sweeter than it's sweeter than soda. That's how sweet it is. Um, it's expensive too. <laughs> it is. It's a, it's a, it's a dessert. It's a dessert wine. You know what I mean? You're not chugging it. You know what I mean? At three o'clock right. in the afternoon, but it, it's a dessert wine. It's it's not the same as like a port, but it falls in that same that category of the, that dessert and liqueur kind of feel. Interesting. There's a special way they press that too. It, it's it has to be below. Don't, don't they press that? actual grape while it's below freezing or, or it's frozen right yes and it, it's risky because if you don't do it quick enough it can actually rot you know what i mean um because it's encased in water you know what i mean it'll dissolve and rot rot away so that's why it's expensive you know what i mean you won't find a cheap ice wine out there yeah it's always in a real skinny bottle too it's not like it's a regular bottle of wine it's uh, no it's not a nice bordeaux kind of what people think a wine bottle looks like so next time I'm out at a at a restaurant, I should tell my wife to get some ice wine. Yes, try it. Because it'd be super sweet for her. What am I going to pay for a glass of that? <laughs> I didn't know. A lot. It's not it's yeah. definitely not cheap. It's not. Definitely not cheap. It's something I mean, to try though. It's but yeah, you don't want it. you you probably probably better off just going to the wine store and buying it, and then that way you don't get. All right, then I'll push her towards the Moscatos. <laughs> exactly. And Mike, when you're at the grocery store, people also don't know this too is. You should drink different wines out of different glasses. That's why you have the. That's why there's a Merlot glass. You know what I mean? There's different types of glasses of wine that you should actually drink the wine out of. If you go, if you look at the box, it'll say it right on the box. People just think it looks nice, and they just do it for show. But it does help. That's why people swirl it and all that. Yeah. Right. 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 There's, there's a lot of intricacies. In, I, I in forget. Wine. You know, I know they. I know they swirl it in the glass, and they. And I know there's something it's called when it like sticks to the side of the glass. And it runs but, down the side. Yep. Yeah, I forget what that's called exactly, but maybe one of our listeners knows. Um, <laughs> but uh, man, I, I, Zach, I mean, I know you've covered a lot of weather with the grapes and weather with the wine. I mean, is there anything we're missing here that you know we might need to talk about? I'm trying to think. Um, oh, well, what happens like in the winter time? Do, do the vineyards continue to grow? Or they kind of go dormant. Yeah, they they, they 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 go dormant. Yeah, they go dormant. So once once the grapes are um off and harvested, the the vines will actually just go dormant. You know I mean they'll they can drop at twenty degrees, they're not going to die. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, like all the leaves will fall off. Um, and then come growing season again, it's just like a, it's just like any other thing. They'll redevelop the little grapes, you know what I mean? And uh, the harvest, the growing season starts all over again. And and it's beautiful when you're out there when, because just like trees, those leaves on those grapes, they change colors too. Um, so I have beautiful pictures in some of those vineyards where it looks just like you go out in the Poconos on a nice autumn day, just in the vineyards, you'll see those autumnish colors throughout all the vineyards. And it's a beautiful sight to see. Yeah, 100% right there, because when I used to work uh, landscaping and lawn care, I remember there was one uh, yard we used to cut that had his own vines uh, for grapes. I think he made his own wine. And uh, yeah, the leaves definitely fall off all the vines and, and you know, because we had to cut the grass in between. Um, so yeah, yeah, 100%. So I, you know, I didn't even think about that and just till now again. It's cool. It is really cool. And like going back to somewhat the weather and instrumentation, they'll actually put temperature sensors 
um, right next to the grape and see what how well, like what the temperature is right around the grape. Um, and especially in California, through the terrain, they'll have their they have weather stations in the coldest spot, in the warmest spot, on a hill, not in a hill, in a valley. You know what I mean? Tucked away if it's next to a building or not, just to see what types because all those different things matter. Um, they'll look at all the data and be like, ah, we'll use this we'll use this side of vineyard for our whatever blend we're going to make or. And that's what sometimes red blends are, is they take a blend of all the grapes, and maybe it wasn't the greatest growing season, so they make a red blend out of it. They'll take a little bit here, a little bit there. and Exactly. I'm sure they're all tasting, and then that, yeah, that's it's got to – Yeah, so we covered all the, uh, the wine and the weather. So now let's just have a little bit of fun and say, what is your favorite wine, Zach? Where are you going with? Wow. I only have one. That's it? I I don't have one. I, do I have to say one? Oh, I guess we got to put him on the spot, Brad. Yeah, you know, you gotta you gotta pick one, and maybe I'll give you a runner up. I'll, I'll tell you what mine is afterwards. Go ahead. I'll probably say a Tempranillo. I don't even know what that is. I've heard. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've heard of it. I'd probably say a Tempranillo. My second's probably a Sangiovese. Okay. My one and two. And the first one that you said, because I'm not even gonna try. Um, was, is that a red or a white? It's a bold red. A bold red. Okay. In the we same talking... family as the Malbacs, you know what I mean? The Bordeaux, the Petite Syrah kind of feel. We talking uh, like a bitter, uh, wine there or? No, it can definitely have a fruit, fruit, fruitier note Fruity to flavor. it. flavor? Yeah. Nice. I love it. Brad? Uh, well, mine is uh, actually, uh, it comes from a, a region in, uh, France. It's the Amarone, I'm sure. Zach has heard that before. I have. Yeah, there. It's a really, it's it's a really good wine. It's and again, as you get, well, I guess as, no, it's Italy. It's Italian. It's an Italian wine. It's 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 from the Italy region called Amarone, and they're really like good. Uh, Amarone Valpicella, those kind of wines. They're expensive, but you know, it's worth it every once in a while to get a good like. You know, bottle of wine, and you'd probably be better off just going to a wine store. And, you know, once in a while, you spend your fifty, sixty dollars, get a bottle of wine like that, and it's 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 different. It's like 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 Zach said. I mean, it's it is so different from just your everyday table wine that you you may buy or something like that. So every once in a while, it's nice to treat yourself to something good like that. Well, mine is a hazy double IPA. Oh wait, that's I'm sorry. No, that's no. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that either. <laughs> there's nothing but, uh, wrong with that either no 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 if, if i'm going for a glass of wine um i'm usually a merlot um i don't have I, i'm i'm more in the uh, uh how I, I don't go too crazy off like the merlot or like a cabernet or maybe i'd have a pinot noir something like that um is usually what i would have but um I don't know if you guys like those style of wines. Maybe it's too mainstream for the wine connoisseur. But there's nothing wrong with a good Pinot Noir. There's definitely there's nothing wrong with that. So if I wanted to try, uh, uh, what would you suggest for me, uh, uh, Zach? Uh, if uh, I like a dry wine, I don't want it to be too bitter. Um, what should I go for? Do you like do you like do you like like a nice steak? Do you like something like that? I love a steak. Try a nice Malbec when you have a steak. Malbec? Malbec. Okay. I'm going to do it. I, I have a uh, gift card to go to a local uh, steakhouse uh, where I live. So it's a little bit upscale. So when I go there, Try I'm nice getting Malbec. a Malbec. I'm going to go it. for it. You won't go wrong. <laughs> yeah, red wine and uh, meat, they go hand in hand. Just like white wine, I guess, with fish is uh, and pasta, right? Yes. There's also nothing wrong with, with nothing beer. Where I lived, I lived in Chico, California, and... You should know this. Uh, you ever heard of Sierra Nevada? Mm-hmm. That's where they're founded. Nice. Um, and taking a, taking a tour of that brewery as well. Another thing out there. People like their beer too. People like their craft beer out there as well. People oh. just like booze in general. It is, <laughs> it is what it is. Well, you know, it, it's good to uh, unwind uh, with a glass of wine or a nice craft beer or whatever you might be having. But uh, Without a doubt. Um, so I, Hey, I think that about does it for this, uh, yeah, wine and great weather. info. Thanks Zach. Um, yeah, I thought it was great. Thanks for being on the uh, podcast with us, Zach. Not a problem. Glad to be here.
And uh, so that is wine and weather. And remember that we'll have a podcast every two weeks. So please come back to The Weather Lounge. You could find that anywhere you find your podcast, whether it be Apple or Spotify or Google, uh, Stitcher, uh, iHeartRadio, wherever you get your podcast, we can be found. Also, shoot us an email if you have any suggestions for the show, weatherlounge at weatherworksinc.com. But in the meantime, thanks for listening, everybody. And please visit our social media channels. Uh, Just look for Weatherworks. Until next time, thanks for listening. 